Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Welcome to this evening's lecture. Um, the management of emerging infectious disease outbreaks is one of the defining problems of our ever more connected world. And so we're very happy today to have Professor Oliver Pibus, uh, the director of our brand new Oxford Martin program on pandemic genomics, talk to us about responding to emerging epidemics. Oliver is also at the Oxford Martin School PI of the Institute for Emerging Infections, um, as well as being the professor of evolution and infectious disease at the Department of Zoology and a prof professorial fellow of New College and, in addition, the chief editor of the open access journal, Virus Evolution. He's interested in topics at the interface between ecology and evolution and spends his time investigating the evolutionary and ecological dynamics of infectious disease. Oliver's going to talk to us for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, there will then be time for some questions. Um, I just need to warn you that this is being uh, webcast, and so when you ask questions, please be aware that you're being filmed, and if that makes you uncomfortable, please don't ask a question. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Oliver Pibus. So thank you very much, Julian. Um, good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, and my thanks to the Oxford Martin School for uh, the opportunity to talk to you all today. So pathogenic microorganisms have, throughout history, posed a potentially devastating threat to humankind. The Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 slayed more than the Great War that immediately preceded it. And the Black Death in the 14th century killed half of Europe and changed the course of history. It also changed the face of Oxford, because in 1379, William of Wickham established New College, just over there, to replace the ranks of established clergy that had been depleted by the Black Death. Now, contemporary epidemics have mercifully been less deadly, but are notably more frequent. And that's a reflection of the increasing connectedness of the modern world. For example, there's over half a million travelers in the air uh, at any one point in time. Growth in the reach and volume and speed of human trade and human mobility over the past century has connected pathogens with new and growing human populations. Now, this figure is from a meta-analysis by Kate Jones and colleagues, and it shows how there's been a growing number of emerging and re-emerging infectious disease outbreaks in recent decades. And most of, those do, most of those are caused by rapidly evolving viruses or bacteria. Some of you might be wondering why this graph peaks in the 1980s. Uh, and that's something of an artifact due to an inclusion in the study of the many different opportunistic infections discovered in immune deficient patients following the discovery of HIV in the 1980s. Some recent emerging infectious disease outbreaks have left a lasting impression. The SARS epidemic of 2002 to 2003 was comparatively brief, yet cost an estimated $40 billion to world trade and reduced airline, tra reduced airline traffic with China by more than 45%. And the Ebola epidemic that began in West Africa in early 2014 <coughs> killed 11,000 people and has left 10,000 children without parents. The problem of emerging infections is both persistent and global. Uh, this image is, is from the website Health Map that's developed at Oxford University, and it shows the hundreds of different infectious disease outbreaks that have been reported around the world this week. These in current events cover every continent and include a large outbreak of cholera in Yemen, and cases of yellow fever virus near Sao Paulo in Brazil, where there's a very large population of people unvaccinated against the disease. So we know that controlling disease outbreaks is very difficult. Uh, in part, that's because of their potential for rapid exponential growth, and that amplifies even small errors or delays in our responses and interventions. And controlling new emerging infections is even harder because we only, at the outset, partially understand the enemy we face. 
Fortunately, epidemics are now analyzed in an objective scientific manner. There are mathematical models of pathogen transmission, and those are used to make informed decisions about how to allocate resources such as vaccines, drugs, and hospital beds. Many current techniques derived from the mathematical framework developed by Sir Roy Anderson and Lord Robert May from the 1970s onwards in Oxford, London, and elsewhere. These approaches, sometimes called the Anderson-May approach, focus on modeling the number of reported disease cases across time and among locations. And an example of the type of data that goes into these studies is shown here. So this graph depicts the number of cases of Ebola reported in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone during the epidemic in West Africa. The, the numbers are for each week. Now, these data are generated by healthcare workers in the field, and then they're collated and analyzed by epidemiologists using mathematical models to predict the magnitude and the duration of the outbreak. One of the key outputs of uh, models such as uh, the ones I mentioned are, is an estimation of a quantity called the basic reproductive number of an epidemic, or more commonly known as R0 or R0. So, what is R0? Well, it's quite simple. It equals the number of new cases that's caused by a single infection in a wholly susceptible population or at the very beginning of an outbreak. And so it's a measure of the intrinsic transmissibility or contagiousness of an infectious disease. If R0 is above 1, then the epidemic uh, will be growing. And if it's below 1, then the epidemic is declining. So R0 can vary um, from close to 1 for a disease that's endemic to above 10 for highly contagious infectious diseases like measles. And to put it simply, the role of all epidemic control interventions is to reduce this number, R0, below 1 as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Now, some of my colleagues might be most surprised that I have managed to explain Arnold in a public lecture without showing a picture of Kate Winslet from the Hollywood movie Contagion. Um, I've resisted. I'm going to move forward. Okay, so mathematical analysis of, of these case numbers, the number of cases through time, can tell us a great deal about disease transmission. So here we see a hypothetical plot of the number of cases of an infectious disease through time. Sometimes this, these kind of data are called epidemic time series. But it's now recognized that these epidemic time series don't fully describe every aspect of an epidemic. To begin to understand why that's the case, let's consider how this time series is actually generated. What's the process that generates an epidemic? Well, it's a transmission tree. What happens is we start with a single infection down here at the bottom left, and the number of cases increases every time we have a transmission event, and the number of cases decreases every time a patient either recovers or uh, a patient is successfully treated, or perhaps when the patient dies. So each transmission event here uh, is shown by a vertical line, and the beginning of the infection is shown by a red dot, and the duration of infection is shown by a horizontal line. And so tracing all of these events together leads to a description of the full transmission history of the epidemic. And this full transmission tree contains not only the same information as the time series, the number of cases through time, it contains extra information. It contains information about who infected whom. Now, in most cases, we don't have this complete information. We don't have the full transmission history. And that's because it requires a great deal of effort to generate. It means that epidemiologists have to go and correctly trace the contacts of every single infected person. But sometimes it is possible to get close to the complete transmission tree. For example, if the outbreak is quite small, or it's deemed to be very important to detect and isolate, perhaps through quarantine, every single person infected. So this is an example of that. It's a figure that shows a near-complete transmission tree for the SARS coronavirus epidemic in Singapore in 2003. And there's something very intriguing here. 
What's notable is that the great majority of the actual cases were caused by just three or four individual infections. And that's a phenomenon known to epidemiologists as superspreading. And behavior like superspreading, because it depends on who infected whom, is very obvious uh, from the transmission tree. But it's really quite difficult to discern if the only data you have is the epidemic time series, the number of cases through time. So wouldn't it be great if there was another way we could get information about the complete transmission tree? Well, there is another way, but somewhat paradoxically, it turns out to be linked to one of the more concerning aspects of emerging infectious diseases. Viruses and bacteria are amongst the fastest evolving entities that we know. The genomes of viruses like HIV or influenza evolve one million times faster than we do. So one year of virus evolution is equivalent to a million years of um, human evolution. Now, the downside of this very rapid evolution is that it enables viruses and bacteria to adapt very swiftly to changing environments. And this rapid adaptation is the cause of many problems, such as the evolution of uh, antibiotic or antiviral drug resistance, uh, the creation of antigenic diversity, and the, it leads to escape from our natural immune responses. However, there's a second consequence of this rapid evolution, and that is that viruses and some bacteria accumulate genetic changes on the same time scale at which transmission is occurring during an epidemic. Now, that sounds quite a dry and theoretical fact, but it actually has some quite deep and profound consequences. It means that the pathogens that we find in each infected person typically have a unique genetic fingerprint, and it creates a reciprocal link between the genetic variants carried by an infection and their propensity for onward transmission in the host population. So to put it simply, that the pattern of genetic differences amongst pathogens contains information about past transmission events. And the term genomic, de genomic epidemiology uh, is now commonly used to describe studies that use pathogen genome sequences to investigate transmission dynamics. The development of genomic epidemiology has been made possible in large part by the incredible advances in genome sequencing technologies over the last 15 years. <coughs> Costs of DNA sequencing, as shown here, have, have fallen faster than exponentially and, for, uh, and substantially outpaced improvements in computer processing speed as represented by Moore's law. As a consequence of this advance, there are now tens or hundreds of thousands of publicly available sequences for many different virus species. This table shows the number of virus gene, virus gene sequences available on the database GenBank for lots of different viral species. The equivalent numbers for bacterial pathogens are increasing fast. During my PhD, uh, a study of genomic epidemiology might include 20 or 30 individual gene sequences. Today, for viruses like HIV or influenza, that number is more likely to be 10,000. And there's no reason in the future why we might not expect data sets of hundreds of thousands or even millions of pathogen genomes. Genome sequencing has also become much more rapid and more portable. And that advance is perhaps best captured in um, this fantastic image of Kate Rubins, the astronaut undertaking genome sequencing above the, uh, on the International Space Station. We're, we're, we're sequencing genomes in space, genomes in space. It's absolutely awesome. The small box that you can see here underneath uh, her screen is a portable genome sequencing device called the MinION. And that was actually developed by uh, an Oxford University spin out company called Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Given then that pathogen genomes are readily available, how do we use them to get insights into epidemic behavior? So, to understand, I'm going to return to our diagram of the full transmission tree. 
and here it is. So uh, usually we don't have the opportunity to reconstruct or observe this complete transmission tree. What happens instead is that we typically sample a fraction of the infections in an outbreak. And so these sampling events are shown here as blue dots. Some, but not all, of the cases have been sampled at different points in time. Then we take each one of those patient samples and subject them to pathogen genome sequencing. And then we use statistical methods to reconstruct a partial transmission tree from those genome sequences. And that partial transmission tree ends up looking like this, and it's called a phylogeny, or an evolutionary tree of the outbreak. And what hopefully these slides show you is that this partial transmission tree contains some, but not all of the information in what we're really interested in, which is the full transmission tree. Now, translating from this complete process to the observed partial tree involves some very complicated mathematical modeling and also a great deal of statistical uncertainty. And a number of new theoretical and computational methods are being developed to undertake that translation. And uh, a new academic field called phylodynamics has arisen just to solve this problem. So that's the potential, but how exactly are pathogen genomes currently used to gain insights into transmission during an outbreak? Well, we can consider a number of questions that it's possible to answer using pathogen genome sequencing. Those questions include, uh, where did an epidemic come from? What are its origins? When did the epidemic start? We might be able to find out a little bit about how contagious or virulent the infectious diseases. We might want to know how fast it's spreading amongst different locations. We might want to know if a certain subset of individuals are epidemiologically linked by transmission. Is the epidemic composed by multiple or single chains of transmission? And what fraction of new cases in a given area are the result of transmission within that area as opposed to the introduction of new cases from outside? And lastly, but not least, uh, we might be able to identify particular mutations carried by a virus or a bacteria that change their behavior, such as drug resistance mutations. So I'm going to give uh, a series of examples uh, that highlight some of these uh, questions and their applications. And it's important to note that because phylogenies contain information not only about the individual cases that you sampled, but about cases that were not directly observed, i.e. the ancestral, the ancestors of the outbreak. They can be used to reconstruct epidemic dynamics before the date at which an epidemic is first discovered. And perhaps the canonical example of that is the analysis of HIV genomes from around the world. So, if we analyze HIV genomes sampled globally, we find that to a high degree of statistical certainty, the global HIV pandemic was established in Central Africa in the early decades of the 20th century. In fact, we can be more precise than that. Uh, we think that the uh, pandemic was established in what's now Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and what was then Leopoldville and under Belgian colonial rule. Now, we can come to those kind of conclusions despite the fact that HIV wasn't discovered until 1983, and almost all of the sequences in our analysis were sampled after that date. When epidemiologists are faced with a new outbreak, they often seek to identify the very first case, and that's called the index case. And that's important to help uh, understand how big the outbreak is and to identify undiagnosed cases. And genetic analyses can help to confirm or refute questions about the index case. Now, it goes without saying that that kind of work needs to be undertaken very sensitively uh, in order to prevent um, people becoming labeled as what used to be known as typhoid Marys, people who are blamed for the cause of an outbreak or persecuted or stigmatized for their role in an outbreak. And 
in what's perhaps one of the most egregious examples of this, there was, in the 1980s, a Canadian living in New York. His name was Gayton Dugas. Uh, and he was given the unfortunate scientific label patient zero, but uh, much worse, he was named in the media and accused of triggering the HIV epidemic in the USA. Later phylodynamic analyses have clearly shown that the HIV epidemic in the USA began many years earlier than that, around 1970, and that Gayton Dugas was in no way distinct from the many, many other people who were infected with HIV at the same time. There was absolutely no reason for him to be singled out, and he had no particularly significant epidemiological um, uh, impact. Now, attributing the, uh, and investigating the source of an outbreak can sometimes have important or uh, economic or political consequences. Uh, and one recent example of that was the um, outbreak of cholera in Haiti in 2010. And that outbreak of cholera occurred in the aftermath of a very severe outbreak there. And there's nothing hugely surprising about that. There's often outbreaks of infectious disease um, following very significant um, natural disasters. However, in this case, early cases of the cholera occurred in a Haitian village that was sited next to a camp that housed UN peacekeepers from Nepal. And that led to claims that that camp was the source of the cholera outbreak. Now, it's difficult to determine when it wasn't entirely surprising that cholera emerged after an epidemic anyway. There's no apparently real way of proving that hypothesis until genome sequencing came along. Genome sequencing of uh, and phylogenetic analysis of the cholera bacteria from Haiti showed that they were almost identical here in this cluster to one of several different strains that were circulating in Nepal at the same time. And that does provide strong evidence that the UN camp was indeed the source of the outbreak. And as a result of that, uh, the UN changed its position and accepted responsibility, and that had important legal and contract contractual consequences. Genomic epidemiology perhaps truly came of age during the uh, so-called swine flu pandemic in 2009. So that's the pandemic of um, H1N1 influenza. This was the first major pandemic of the genomic era, during which large numbers of virus genome sequences were generated and shared online in real time as the pandemic unfolded. Now, although it's true that virus genomes were also generated during the SARS epidemic, uh, they were much less widely shared and had much less epidemiological impact. Immediately after the discovery of um, pandemic swine flu, its most important property, which is its pathogenicity or virulence, was not known. And that uncertainty was real and caused a great deal of not entirely uh, misplaced concern. <coughs> And that's because the, the worst case scenario for pandemic flu, which is that the virus has a case fatality rate of half a percent or one percent or higher, would have been exceptionally bad news indeed. Now, the new flu strain was first reported in mid-April 2009, and within just a week or so, a number of flu genomes had been generated and shared online. Myself and uh, many others around the world began to analyze those genomes. And within a couple of days, we'd find out something quite unexpected and important. And that is that the swine flu outbreak had been present and circulating among humans for several months and not just a couple of weeks. And this was perhaps the first evidence, albeit indirect, that this pandemic swine flu was not unusually virulent. And the reason for that is that it's very unlikely that a, a new flu strain with a case fatality rate of a half of percent or more would be able to circulate in human populations for several months without escaping detection. So during the swine flu pandemic, it was possible for the, the first time to apply both traditional and genomic epidemiology in parallel as the outbreak unfolded. And this advance was reflected in the WHO 
World Health Organization Rapid Pandemic Assessment Report, which notably included side-by-side -side estimates of this key parameter, R0, one obtained from traditional epidemiological sources and the other one solely from viral genetic data. Now, the two estimates were largely congruent, and that's important because these two estimates come from different sources of data and were obtained using methods that make very different sets of assumptions. And so having two separate sources of information about a key parameter is valuable because we can then cross-validate each independent approach. Large-scale genomic sequencing of early pandemic swine flu cases also provided new insights into transmission behavior. This figure shows an evolutionary tree of swine flu cases from around the world, and the cases highlighted in red are those that were early swine flu cases from the UK. So you can see that there are multiple independent clusters of UK sequences. So early pandemic swine flu cases in the UK were not the result of a single introduction followed by spread within the UK, but actually were caused by multiple separate introductions, mostly via airline passengers from the USA, each of which established a separate uh, chain of transmission in the UK. And importantly, these separate transmission chains were not all equal. Some of them were very small and quickly died out, and some of them were large and persisted across multiple waves of infection. And I'd argue that pathogen genomes are really perhaps unique in their ability to provide insights such as these. Nowhere was that more evident than in studies of the West African Ebola epidemic. Genomic analyses of the Ebola outbreak were groundbreaking for several reasons. The first was the scale of sequencing that was undertaken. We have more than one and a half thousand complete virus genomes from the epidemic, which means that more than 5% of every Ebola case had its <coughs> virus genome sequence. Secondly, once sequence was uh, eventually established, it was undertaken in near real time, which meant that the results of phylogenetic transmission analysis had the potential to feed back into epidemic control decision making. And thirdly, much of the sequencing was undertaken in the field in West Africa in countries that had little or no pre-existing genomic capacity. Now creating those field DNA sequencing centers was an amazing achievement. Um, Ian Goodfellow from Cambridge was uh, a person who led one such center in Sierra Leone. And he generated this list, which I think might be slightly tongue-in-cheek, but certainly has a, a large grain of truth to it. And so uh, it provides an interesting insight into the challenges they faced. Ian's ranked the relative risks faced in the field. And somewhat surprisingly, Ebola is in very small type down here at the bottom. Uh, and he felt it was much less of a concern than road traffic accidents or numerous and frequent electrical fires. So Ian and his team generated more than 500 genomes during the latter half of the epidemic. And those were combined with epidemiological contact tracing. And together, those two sources of data helped to identify the sources of sporadic cases that continued to emerge for many months. And uh, it, this is the, the, the study that reported his 500 genomes in a particularly good scientific journal. And, uh, and um, it, the study also helped to identify some very unconventional transmission routes, uh, such as transmission through semen or th through breast milk. And we think those um, transmission routes might have contributed to the recrudescence of Ebola transmission in some regions from which it had been previously eradicated. The Ebola genomes generated in West Africa mean that we understand the process of transmission during an epidemic at perhaps a greater resolution than ever achieved before. Now, Gitas Dudas and Andrew Rombo from the University of Edinburgh created a, a fantastic animation that helps to visualize this. So the animation should be rolling. What it shows is the spread. Oh, let's go again. Okay, 
The animation's rolling. Now, what this animation is going to show is the spread of the Ebola epidemic starting there in early 2014 in Gwekadu in Guinea. Guinea's in green. And then the virus is moving to both Sierra Leone, which is in blue, and Liberia in red. And you can see the little comets, the black comets that are moving from one location to another. And that's representing how chains of transmission switched from one location to another. Now, transmission intensity peaked around about now in late 2014. The color, uh, background color of each region is shaded in according to the intensity of transmission in that region. And then during 2015, you can see that the transmission was gradually declining. And eventually, these sporadic cases came to an end, and so did the epidemic. And it's important to realize that that reconstruction is based solely on information from virus genome sequences. And it shows just how complex and heterogeneous the epidemic was. If we focus on any one region, transmission chains were surprisingly small and short-lived, but were continually reseeded by introduction of virus from other regions. This is quite a new perspective on epidemic behavior. And as a consequence, this analysis and others like it are showing just how important patterns of human mobility amongst locations are to understanding epidemic behavior. More recently, we've been applying lessons learned from Ebola to understand Zika virus in the Americas. Zika, as I'm sure many of you know, is a mosquito-transmitted virus that can cause microcephaly and other developmental defects in babies if a mother is infected with the virus uh, early in pregnancy. So together with uh, a collaboration with many Brazilian institutes and colleagues from around the world, we developed the Zebra Project. And uh, we undertook the Zebra Project to characterize the genetic diversity of the virus and to understand how Zika spread through Brazil and to other regions in the Americas. And as well as answering those uh, scientific questions, the Zebra Project had a secondary aim, which was to build capacity in genomic epidemiology in Brazil. And the Zebra Project involved the use of a mobile laboratory, and that was called the Zebra Bus, that traveled across northeast Brazil uh, from Natal to Salvador in 2016. Now, the northeast region of Brazil was chosen because that's the region with the with the greatest number of Zika cases and the greatest number of severe microcephaly cases. And this mobile lab visited public health centers across the region over two weeks and screened untested samples from patients and sequenced virus, Zika virus genomes en route. And the results from that screening were reported back to the local health centers within two or three days of the arrival of the bus in each region. Now, the field work for this project was led by Nick Lohman from the University of Birmingham and Nuno Farrier from the Department of Zoology here in Oxford. And you can see Nuno here uh, loading the Minion portable sequencing device that we saw earlier in space with a sample from a potentially Zika-infected patient. Um, Nick is down here at the left, and I am confident confidently assured that he is doing some uh, important bioinformatics and not watching Game of Thrones. So this Minion device highlights a trend towards increased portability of, of lab equipment to the extent that most of the equipment needed for genome sequencing can now fit in a carry-on suitcase. Here's the Minion at the top, some various other uh, reagents, and there's still room left over for two packs of biscuits very important. Okay, so what were the results of the Zebra Project? This uh, phylogeny here shows the, uh, or summarizes the main results. The project generated Zika virus genomes from across Brazil, and those were combined with genomes from elsewhere to analyze the spread and establishment of the epidemic in the Americas. So what's important in this figure is the dotted line. Uh, the vertical axis is a time scale and so the dotted line represents the date at which Zika was first detected in the Americas. So what we can see is that the 
common ancestor of the epidemic, which is this node here, B, in early 2014 or late 2013, was substantially before the date that the virus was first discovered in the Americas, over a year earlier. And we also can see that the outbreak in the Americas derived from just a single introduction of the virus into the continent. And we think that was most likely from previous epidemics in French Polynesia or Pacific Islands. If we look at the location information here, the epidemic in the Americas became established in the blue location, which is northeast Brazil in the early part of 2014. And it then spread from northeast Brazil, not only to other regions in Brazil, including the large southern cities of Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, but also to other countries in South America and to other regions in the Americas, such as Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. And it actually spread to all of those other locations, which are shown in different colors, in the period before the virus was discovered in the Americas. So in each region, there was six or 12 months of hidden cryptic transmission that was unknown to the public health authorities. So the epidemic as a whole was generated by a series of founder events, each resulting from human transmission amongst human travel amongst locations in, in the Americas. So this is scientifically very interesting, but how exactly does it help us uh, treat or understand Zika better? Well, I think it is important because one of the main questions facing Zika research is to determine what fraction of birth defects are due to the virus as opposed to other causes. And to properly understand that, we need to know the different dates that Zika first appeared in each region because microcephaly cases before Zika arrived in a given location shouldn't be attributed to the virus. I mentioned briefly earlier that pathogen genomes have the potential to reveal the presence of mutations that might affect pathogen behavior. And our work on Zika provides another example of this. So in an early genetic analysis uh, in 2016, we were able to identify 11 mutations in the virus that were associated with the uh, unfolding epidemic in the Americas. And one of these mutations, which occurs at site 139 of the PRM protein of the virus, has since been investigated in a series of lab experiments. And other researchers in those experiments have shown that this mutation increases virus replication in nerve cells and inhibits the growth of nervous tissue in mice. So this genome analysis was able to pinpoint a very small subset of mutations that were then uh, could then be the focus of more in-depth investigation and testing in the lab. And further work is ongoing to test whether these effects are, in fact, uh, indeed important in natural infections and not just in the lab. Genomic epidemiology, I'm painting a rosy picture, but it's not entirely without its problems. And one problem that arises in this field is when we have uh, different levels of intensity of sampling in different locations. And if we're not careful, we can find that we end up with biased conclusions if our data set is highly biased. We had uh, a situation which we had to resolve like this when we studied uh, the outbreak of Zika virus in Florida, in Miami, in the USA. So the phylogeny on the left shows uh, the cases from the USA, which are in blue, and uh, related cases from the Caribbean, which are in yellow. And we can see that the, ca the cases in the USA originated from the Caribbean. And if we were to naively interpret this uh, graph, we would assume that there'd been three transmissions of movements of the virus from the Caribbean to the USA. However, we believe that such an, uh, an interpretation would be biased, and that's because the fraction of cases that are sampled in the USA is way higher than the fraction of cases that were sampled in the Caribbean. So we're potentially missing a vast amount of diversity of the virus in the Caribbean. So three is actually a lower bound. There could have been many more introductions than three. And in fact, when the genomic data was combined with some 
uh, quite sophisticated mathematical modeling by Moritz Kramer and others, we found that uh, uh, we could estimate that the number of introductions of Zika into the USA was actually more like 20 and potentially even higher, 30 or 40, than the three observed. So um, these kind of uh, sampling biases need to be very carefully considered when we're doing uh, phylo dynamic analyses. So genomic epidemiology is a very exciting and rapidly challenging field. I'm extremely lucky to have um, started my research career at the very beginning of this field and seen it through its continuing development. There are a number of challenges ahead. I'll just briefly outline a couple of them. Some of these uh, challenges facing genomic epidemiology are technical, scientific challenges. We need to, uh, to be able to sequence genomes cheaper and faster uh, and in more and more remote places. And often a large amount of the challenge there is to do with the bio, uh, computation analysis and bioinformatics. So we need faster analysis uh, of these very large data sets that we're starting to generate. A second challenge is not scientific or technical, but it's actually social, and that's to do with what happens with the genome sequences when they're generated. Now, there is uh, a feeling amongst many researchers in this field that pathogen genome sequences, especially during a public health emergency, should be shared uh, immediately as possible, uh, perhaps immediately after generation, and uh, one shouldn't wait until a scientific paper is reviewed and published before the data is shared. And, uh, and that is a feeling um, or, or, or a position also advocated by the World Health Organization. But it's important to realize that these pathogen genome sequences are something of a, a shared public good. They're costly to generate and everyone benefits from them if we can see them. But that also potentially means that people are able to benefit from the shared data without releasing data they've generated themselves, um, at least not immediately. So we need to find ways to incentivize researchers to share their data and so that they feel comfortable that they can share their data without other people, uh, in a sense, scooping their results before they get a chance to... Uh, publish them. People should be able to get credit for their own work while still being able to share their data in an open and accessible way. A third challenge, which um, is, is part of the uh, Oxford Martin School program on pandemic genomics, is to incorporate the information obtained from pathogen genomes more directly into health reporting and into uh, policy making, into decision making by ministries of health, civil servants and so on. I think uh, we're potentially missing out on a very valuable source of information when decisions are made uh, uh, at an at a administrative or political level. So we need to engage very directly with those groups to explain the benefits of the, this kind of uh, analysis and also explain the problems that can arise from them. And I've also alluded to the fact that actually, if we try and answer questions using genetic data alone, uh, sometimes we have a very great deal of statistical uncertainty. And actually, what we need to do is integrate the genetic data with other sources of uh, information. And particularly important sources of information is uh, very high resolution information on human mobility. So each of us carries around with us in our pocket a tracking device, it's our mobile phone. And uh, analysis of mobile phone or uh, smartphone app data can provide incredibly detailed uh, information about how individuals move, including how mobility might move uh, mobility might change in the response to uh, a disaster or an epidemic. And we need to also integrate the epidemic time series data with the uh, pathogen genomes. So that, in short, is a summary of the aims of the Oxford Martin School Programme on Pandemic Genomics, which is a four-year project, and we will be advertising uh, some research posts for that, which I very much hope 
um, people might help to circulate and promote. And we're also looking forward to working alongside another project, um, a Wellcome Trust Collaboration Award uh, called the Arctic Network. And the Arctic Network is answering some of those other questions from my previous slide, such as the technical challenges of performing laboratory work and sequencing in the field and uh, dealing with high-performing computing problems. Okay, so uh, I have far too many collaborators to thank individually. I want to thank everyone around the world that we do our work with, and particularly to everyone in my group who is here or not. I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your questions. Great, give me a minute. <laughs> it's really helpful. Okay, uh, so the chap there. With, in the... Uh, so, thanks for a great talk, Oliver. Oh, sorry, could you pass the microphone forward to the oh. chap a couple of rows in front, and then it will come back to you. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Um, I think there's a tendency sometimes to think that the genomic data will give us everything that we need, and um, so, some analyses seem to uh, ignore or not look, look for the linked metadata, so clinical outcomes and phenotypes of what's happening. And I think also that's sometimes more difficult to share more globally because people will happily sometimes release genome sequences but not necessarily details of patients and ages and stuff like that. And I wondered if you could talk about some of the challenges in that and the ways forward that we could find to get more information from the genomic sequences that we have. Um, I was at a... Uh, WHO meeting on pandemic genome data sharing a few weeks ago where exactly these challenges were, were discussed. Um, it's a really interesting set of problems with both scientific, technical, and social aspects. And I don't think anyone's got a, um, a, a simple solution yet. Um, there is an interesting culture clash between geneticists and genomicists where the assumption is that you will always share your gene sequences and put them on GenBank, whether immediately or after a delay for everyone to analyze. The uh, culture of perhaps epidemiologists and those on the more clinical side is to be very cautious about patient confidentiality. And uh, often those uh, individual level pieces of information are aggregated or kept entirely private. Now that these two kind of sets of data are coming towards each other, we're going to have a point where we've got to resolve um, the tension between those two approaches. I, I, I'm not entirely sure how it is going to resolve. Um, maybe somewhere in between would actually benefit both fields. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Oliver. Uh, in the Zika case here, uh, where there is vector-borne versus human-to-human -human transmission. Can you see a trace of that in the phylogeny of the infections? Yeah, so I mean, the, the current thinking is that human-to-human um, -human transmission, sexual transmission of Zika, contributes perhaps really quite a small amount at the epidemiological level. So in, in terms of contributing to onwards transmission, it's not thought to be a significant factor. Um, and because it's quite rare, and there is uncertainty over how common it is, so I could be wrong, um, because it's thought to be quite rare, we don't think it will be very easy to pick up the signature of uh, sexual human-to-human -human transmission versus vector-borne transmission very easily. The other problem is we don't actually have that many sequences from the vectors, from mosquitoes. Um, most of our, almost all, only a handful of genomes have actually been obtained from the vectors, almost all from patients. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. You mentioned right at the start that these viruses, many viruses, evolve millions of times faster than we do. Is it understood, or do we understand anything about, at the molecular biology level, why some viruses can evolve very rapidly and while others don't? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, we think we do have a fairly good understanding of why that is. Uh, there are a number of different factors. 
Uh, the most important one is due to the error rate of the enzyme called polymerase that uh, copies the genome. Now, in our genome, we have a DNA polymerase that includes a very large subunit that tries to correct for errors. And there are a number of DNA repair mechanisms that go on after DNA replication to, to correct for errors that are introduced. Uh, most RNA viruses uh, do not have, um, and many DNA viruses don't have this um, error correction machinery, and therefore they introduce, the, the, the errors that are introduced at a very high rate into their genome aren't corrected later. And they're also introduced at a higher rate because the polymerase makes more errors uh, per se. A second reason is that their generation times are so short. So it's only, say, three or four days it takes HIV to get into a cell, replicate, and into the next cell, whereas our generation time is 20 to 25 years and increasing. So those are some of the reasons why there's such a large difference. <laughs> you referred to the uh, outbreak of cholera in Haiti, I think. Sure, you, yeah. You attributed it to the Nepalese UN workers. Uh, uh, I believe. I, 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 that's a conclusion that's been drawn, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... To, how did that come about? I mean, did they bring it over from Nepal? Sure, so the, these, these would have been... They were not suffering from it. Um, <laughs> now, cholera bacteriology is not my field. However, it's quite possible uh, that people could have been um, infected and not severely ill, or they could have been uh, uh, asymptomatic when they initially came to the camp and then only became ill after they arrived. So there are a number of ways at which people would travel whilst still transmissible. This kind of actually raises a quite interesting uh, uh, property of an infectious disease, which is the relative timing of transmissibility versus symptoms. And that actually really strongly determines how easy it is to control an outbreak. So flu is incredibly difficult to control because it's transmissible before people really get very sick. So it's possible for flu to spread all around the world by people who think they're quite healthy and they get on airplanes. Something like SARS, uh, people tended to get sick around the same time that they were transmissible. So that means that isolating and quarantine people who got very ill immediately was able to stop onward transmission. Uh, cholera, I don't know enough about to know the exact timing of transmissibility versus... But, but you said the genome of the uh, outbreak was similar to the one in Nepal. Yeah, it was effectively rather identical. Rather than yeah. anywhere else. Yeah, so I mean, that's a kind of like genetic fingerprinting type analysis. It says that this outbreak in Haiti is effectively a very close relative of an outbreak around the same time in Nepal. And it's very unlikely that that close similarity would occur by chance. Okay, question at the back. Thanks. Um, thank you for your really interesting talk. I'm um, just sort of building on um, this question as well about transmissibility versus um, when symptoms actually start appearing um, in populations. Um, and you showed that example as well of um, when Zika virus was actually introduced to, um, to South America and how it spread before we were able to actually um, sort of isolate the, the genome and sequence it. Um, what sort of research is being done in terms of um, predicting viruses that we have in certain parts of the world, for example, and, and predicting where um, they might actually um, cause an epidemic elsewhere in the world? And is that something that can be done through genome sequencing? That's a really good question and a matter of considerable debate in the field at the moment. Um, uh, so there is a, uh, a, an idea that if we were able to sequence and identify the thousands and thousands, potentially millions of viruses that are out there and undiscovered, we would have enough data that if we look at it carefully, we'll be able to identify properties of those 
viruses that make them more likely to perhaps jump from a different species into humans and to spread amongst uh, humans and cause an outbreak. Um, there are others who believe that that is always going to be a scientifically unfeasible task. No matter how much data you get, the problem is too complicated and you'll not be able to predict um, uh, uh, which ones will cause an outbreak. And my position is I would very much like the research money to try, <laughs> even if we fail. Um, based on the genomic information that you had from Zika in Brazil, uh, is that possible to tell why the epidemic started at that time? Because probably the population was naive to the virus. And why is it decreasing now? Is there any genomic evolution that could help to explain that? Or is that based on the population? Um... Yeah, there's some guys just on two rows behind you that are working exactly on that question. Uh, but in, um, in, in short, yeah, you're right. The, the whole, the Americas have never seen Zika before as far as we know, so the entire population was susceptible, which is why it spread through the continent so rapidly. Um, and yes, we do think that the fact that so many people have been infected now with Zika, and to the best of our knowledge, being infected once with Zika will protect you from being reinfected for the rest of your life. So that built up what's called herd immunity in the population. And that then makes it very difficult for the virus to find a new host to infect because most of the, uh, the, the people that a mosquito will bite have already had Zika and they've got antibodies to Zika and therefore the, uh, the virus isn't able to create a new infection. So it could be quite variable amongst locations. Perhaps some locations have had large amounts of infection and lots of herd immunity and other locations actually are perhaps still susceptible to an outbreak. Uh, we don't know. But yeah, really active area of current research. Hello. I'm, I'm out of date. What's the latest news? Has Zika subsided? And is there any prospect of the neurotropic variant actually being eliminated or eradicated? It's, it's um, still a matter of debate whether that mutation is, is, uh, is definitely causing increased virulence in, in human infections. Um, the actual number of cases is going down because of this effect of herd immunity. I mean, you've got to realize that Zika causes very mild symptoms in most people it infects. And so most, many people have been infected with Zika and, and not uh, known they've been infected at all. Uh, it's only really a, a problem if, if you're a pregnant mother and you get infected. That's where the, the serious consequences arise for most people. Uh, there are exceptions, but for most people, being infected with Zika is no worse than, than a kind of mild flu. Uh, has it spread enough to cause Yeah, we, uh, in some regions, yes. There could still be some more transmission for the next year or two. The mathematical models are predicting that those outbreaks will get smaller and smaller, and in a few years' time, Zika will just be at a very low level in the Americas. Uh, it might re-emerge in 20 or 30 years' time when many children have been born and who have never been exposed to the virus. I, I know there are more hands, but uh, we're going to have to close there, but I'm sure Oliver can be <laughs> um, approached up here afterwards if you have any more burning questions. Um, thank you very much, Oliver, for a fascinating walk through um, some really, really important um, work. And I think um, the significance and potential of some of this and is very clear and why we're so excited uh, to be involved with you on, on this new program. Um, before we thank Oliver perhaps one more time, um, I would like just to say we have our last um, public lecture of the term next week. Um, same time, five o'clock in this room, Professor Joe Boyden, the director of the Young Lives Program, and Professor Sandy Fredman, director of the Human Rights Hub, um, will be talking on the future of women in Africa under the title Production, Reproduction, and Empowerment. So a very different topic to close the term, um, but perhaps we can close this evening with one final round of applause for Oliver. Thank you. Thank you.